All right, so I think we can go ahead and uh, get started. Um, my name is Justin Randolph Thompson and I am a, a professor at um, uh, New York University Florence um, and I am the co-founder and director of um, Black History Month Florence and uh, of the Black Cultural Center, the Recovery Plan um, here. And we're really, really happy to be back with you here um, with the New York University Florence community um, and to be sharing with you another event um, that's connected to Black History Month Florence's 2022 program. Um, for those of you that don't know, Black History Month Florence was initiated in 2016 together with Andre Halyard, um, it, it, you know, a number of other individuals, Andrea Mi, um, Janine Gael Diuji, coming together to sort of work around what it might look like to create a network of individuals, associations, institutions, um, and protagonists that are looking at um, Black history and the history of people of African descent in the context of Italy, and really um, grappling with all of the uh, uh, multiplicity that that involves. Um, and so um, over the years, we've uh, really uh, brought together a pretty broad range of partners, and we're really, really uh, happy uh, about the fact that with New York University Florence, um, they've been a partner since the very beginning, and they've really uh, supported our work and I think advanced a number of very um, important conversations um, along the way. Um, tonight, we're particularly um, glad to sort of be joining you. Um, the series of events that we decided to um, set up in the context of uh, New York University Florence um, um, this year um, are also about kind of introductions. Um, one of the things that we really felt a necessity to do was to think about all of the people that are doing really amazing programming, uh, really amazing development of projects that are within our sort of sphere, and to think about what it might look like to sort of introduce them to this audience and to have the opportunity, which is actually pretty rare for us, to sit down and actually talk through some of the layers of the work, some of the intersections. Um, and so that's really the objective um, th tonight. Um, we're, we're joined um, by Ernest Hill, who's the, the director of Soul of Nations, and um, really, really um, excited. Um, I, I met Ernest um, through um, sort of a range of different connections, actually, you know, as is typical, where, you know, we're, we're introduced, like, at a distance of, like, five days apart by different realities, right, coming together and saying, hey, you know, you need to be connecting. Um, and um, I love those kinds of meetings because it also becomes, uh, for, for me, in the context of Florence, when people are coming into Florence and interested in doing work, um, it's always important to extend that sort of uh, welcome, right? Um, and to really think about the ways in which um, just sort of being present and operating within this space becomes a way to really share um, some of the work that needs to be done um, and to find those solidarities. And with Ernest, we've had an ongoing um, conversation and relationship over these years, really um, looking at Soul of Nations, what they represent, all of the things that they bring into the space of Italy, which I think is uh, extremely unique um, and, you know, particularly excited um, to, to connect um, over um, a a recent um, project that is, I think, still in process of being carried out. Um, so tonight, we really just wanted to kind of take a moment and, you know, start with the really basic introduction of what is uh, Soul of Nations, and then maybe uh, transition from that into thinking a little bit about how Soul of Nations shows up in the context of Italy, the impact of showing up in this environment, and then, you know, some of the work that um, that is being developed more recently is what we'll navigate towards. So um, without really uh, diving in, um, any further, I want to sort of uh, open the floor to to Ernest. Um, thank you for for joining me, and um, you know, thank you for being willing to engage in this conversation and share with us. And you know, if you want to just tell us a little bit um, for those that don't know, what is Soul of Nations, um, and um, what does it represent? What and and then how does it end up in Italy? Right, right. Well, first, just thanks for that awesome intro. Maybe you feel uh, bigger than I am, <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure getting to know you, Justin. Over the it has been over the years. Like during the pandemic period, everything just seems to fly by. But um, it's been a pleasure, and I appreciate the warm welcome um, since I've been operating in, in Florence. Uh, but Soul of Nations. Uh, again, my name is Ernest Hill. I'm the director of Soul of Nations, and I was one of the founding members of the organization as well. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in New York and Washington, D.C., uh, with offices in parts of Europe, uh, Africa, and South America. We exist to uplift Indigenous and Black youth and communities through the arts, 
policy research and scholarship. Um, we hold a variety of programs that provide grants to researchers and artists um, and academics alike uh, to uplift not only culture, but um, important issues that migrant communities uh, or minority communities are facing. So just bringing light to that in contemporary ways where the, uh, the younger generation and all generations alike can understand um, and our, the core of our the core of our missions and our core of our programs really are to invite intercultural dialogue um, in a peaceful manner, um, but then also in an, an altruistic manner, an honest an honest and transparent way uh, to build a platform for free expression without fear or judgment. Um, so that's a bit about like about our work. Um, so right now we're operating in about say seven different countries, um, connecting indigenous and black communities together locally. Um, and yeah, it's been a blast so far. We were incorporated in 2016 and started doing international work uh, in 2017. Um, what brought us to Italy uh, was we opened a gallery in Genova in the north of Italy and the region of Liguria um, as a way of bringing Native American artists to Genova, which is the birthplace of Christopher Columbus, um, to expound upon the themes of what it means to be uh, colonized and then how do we decolonize and how do we heal from uh, you know, colonial and intergenerational trauma. Um, so that was a, a rather successful project, I think, um, because we were able to bring uh, about four artists uh, per year um, for residencies and they would perform cultural he healing ceremonies and educate the masses that indigenous populations in the Americas are one, still alive, still very present, thriving and their cultural practices and life ways. Um, and they have a voice uh, and they have a message to share with the world. Um, so that was one facet of why we came to Italy initially. Upon our arrival, uh, we do have a, all BIPOC staff. Um, so uh, it was a bit of an adjustment acclimating to uh, Italy's workforce, if you, if you could say. Uh, um, and we quickly realized that there were not a lot of Black people or people of color in the workplace, especially in the arts and cultural sector. Um, so we realized that we had a greater responsibility as an organization to not only focus on bringing you know, American populations to Italy, but also advocating for the people who look like me and you who are in Italy every day and you know, fighting the good fight. <laughs> uh, it was a good fight, but it's also a fight that not too many people, especially in the States know about um, or recognize or deem uh, as equally as important as you know, the Black Lives Matter movement in the States. Um, because it, you know, it's a plight nonetheless, but it's very different than uh, navigating space or navigating spaces in America. Um, so we really wanted to channel our resources and energy to help Afro Italians, like in ways that we can, in any ways possible that we can. And that kind of informed uh, the program that we're facilitating right now, called the Indigenous Advocacy and Research Program, uh, which the, the core of it is to fight. Afrophobia, Af anti blackness in Italy by way of policy research and advocacy. Uh, we have one of our fellows on the call, Jessica. Uh, she's based in Verona. And uh, we have three fellows in total in Italy and then one in Germany. And they're all focusing on different areas of research um, about policies or structures that make their lives really difficult in Italy, not only their lives, but the lives of uh, thousands of other uh, Black Italians or recent uh, immigrants to Italy. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of, I know that was pretty uh, pretty long intro, but. No, that, that's not long. It's, I mean, I think that, you know, like um, one of the things that I've always been fascinated by and really excited by in the work that you are carrying out is the complexity of it, right? That it's so layered um, and that each gesture sort of carries with it also, um, a sort of symbolic weight. Um, so, I mean, when we first met and you were telling me about the gallery in Geneva, um, 
you know, I was, it, I was really sort of blown away by what that might look like and what that might signify just from, as a symbolic gesture, even outside of the direct impact of bringing artists, of bringing practices um, into Genova, but really also, um, you know, in, in thinking about the ways in which um, as we uh, engage in conversations around um, um, colonial history, colonial legacies, um, I think that sometimes um, there's this uh, um, lack of recognition of the way in which, you know, people move in different directions, right? And so it's also possible to all show up in Columbus's home, right? Um, and what the way in which we show up there, maybe that creates a, a certain kind of um, unrest and unsettling of the sort of order which might seem to make sense within the trajectory of history that ultimately, um, you know, needs needs to be wrestled with, right? Um, and I think that uh, Geneva is a really a particular place, of course, to to go into the history of, of Columbus, and it's one that that is actually really natural, right? Um, but at the same time, I think probably in the mind of many people in the United States, it's not something they're thinking about, right? Um, not really no. thinking about where Columbus is coming from. They're mm -hmm. thinking about the fact that he arrived in this place and that impact. And I think there's really interesting um, way in which your project. Um, that project specifically sort of asks us to really think about, yeah, you know, but how did, where does this start, um, right? And how do we go to that point of origin and, you know, and, and do something? Uh, and I really, really appreciate the fact that um, you, you talked about the layering of art, scholarship, policy. Um, and I, I wonder if you would talk a little bit, um, I mean, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, the gallery in, in, in Geneva in terms of the, the experience, because I'm, I'm imagining, especially as like, uh, uh, an introduction, if you will, to Italy, that's a very particular kind of introduction to show up with that work. Um, it produces a very specific form of, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't use the word welcome, right? Because it's, it's maybe it's, it's unwelcome, but it's a very specific kind of impact on the environment. So I wonder if you talk about that and then maybe talk a little bit about the intersections between art, scholarship and policy, because these things seem to sort of show up and layer into each other. Um, how do you see those relationships? How do you navigate the sort of values that each one carries and uh, how do they feed each other? Yeah, yeah. Geneva, Geneva is a whirlwind, I'll say that. It was a, it's a beautiful, beautiful city um, with amazing people. Um, of course, there were challenges along the way. Uh, initially, how we got started with the project in Geneva was through a partnership with the municipality of Geneva. Um, so we came in, with, came in with the concept of showcasing contemporary indigenous artists and the birthplace of Christopher Columbus uh, by way of like decol uh, decolonizing artistic spaces. We were located in a museum or really a castle called Castello de Vertis um, in Castelletto, part of Geneva. And yeah, in theory, it was an amazing way to introduce uh, the Genovese or Italian society to indigenous culture, arts and culture. And there it was much curiosity, like you had a great number of attend attendees for events and um, you know, rather positive feedback from the works themselves. Uh, however, there was a huge cultural disconnect in terms of just like the basics of what Native Americans look like, what the, who they are now. Uh, yeah, it was it, it was a bit of a challenge, especially when we're getting into some of the deeper themes of like who Columbus was and why why are they coming here to talk about the atrocities that you know he caused to their peoples. And for many, it was really surprising that many students were never taught like the true history. Um, and it just goes into, it makes you think about like the education system um, and like, you know, the families, like what are they telling their children? And like, why are these stories, these false narratives being passed down from generation to generation? And Genovese particularly, they have a really, really like sense of pride when it comes to Columbus. They're like, Columbus parades and huge festivals where people spend millions and millions of dollars in sponsorships just to uphold the narrative that Columbus is the savior of the world. And that for me, coming from the States was like mind boggling. I couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, so luck, I mean, 
it, it was a slow, a gradual transition to like reaching a cultural understanding, particular, particularly among the youth, like students, they're more open. Um, but Geneva is also a pretty like old city. So a lot of people go there to retire. Um, so you can't really, there's a saying, you can't uh, teach a, an old dog new tricks. So we weren't necessarily trying to change the minds of like people over, or people who are outside of uh, like the, the university level. Um, but we did want to start a dialogue. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think, I think having this discussion was important nonetheless. Um, there were like points of like hostility uh, regarding some of the exhibition themes because the first exhibition we had was called Landscapes from Within. It was basically like an introduction to how indigenous peoples and people of color connect to the land. And it's uh, kind of a personification of natural landscapes. Like the, the land is body and uh, you know, we are all deemed sacred. Um, and so that was an interesting uh, introduction to indigenous arts and culture. Um, but then like some of the other exhibitions began going into more uh, socio-political or uh, socioeconomic themes are related to like how indigenous culture is, can be deemed as a commodity and uh, kind of like put into a box of like product that can be sold. Um, so when we reached those kinds of themes, it, that's where there was some tension or confusion, points of confusion um, uh, at times. But nonetheless, the artwork was phenomenal. So if nothing else, they can just appreciate the work. Um, when we would bring the artists, so we would bring four artists per year for residencies, and they would give lectures at schools. And just hearing the artists tell their story about, you know, their family's history with colonialism and like the trail of tears and being displaced, it brought tears to a lot of students' eyes. They had no idea that, you know, Native American communities or people of color in the States dealt with this type of uh, inter intergenerational trauma. So I think overall, uh, mixing or kind of intertwining, like you're saying, like art and policy, it, it's all connected because, you know, <laughs> Our art, is, art is political, whether we like to admit it or not, or it can be. Um, and I think that we call it artist advocacy. Like when you have these themes, artistic themes that are rooted in a, spe a specific cause, it can give it more, uh, it can amplify the message more and make it more palatable uh, for the viewer. I don't know, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that um, um, some of some of the power is is um, uh, some of that space for conversation. Um, some of the things that are said explicitly, but at the same time in a nuanced way that will feel less explicit, right? Um, yeah. Some of the more forceful conversations that show up, and there's that space to sort of talk about what's actually being produced through the work. Um, so, I, yeah, I see the the, the layering of that. Um, is really powerful and of course I think that in the context of Italy there's this uh, a bit of an irony sometimes where the um, the value that's given to the history of art um, is not really the value that's given to art more broadly um, and so there's an awareness of the capacity of art to really shape society in the past but there's less attention that's being paid to the ways in which art is shaping society today um, and so these kinds of interventions right I mean you say art is uh, political I mean when when you're showing up from the U.S. with these projects in Geneva, there's a political gesture just in being there, right? right. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's powerful in and of itself, no matter what you're doing in the gallery. Um, yeah. But I wanted to sort of shift gears a little bit with you into talking about um, the, um, hold on a second, let me open this up the uh, Indigenous Advocacy and Research Program, um, you know, because I think that, um, it, it was really uh, beautiful to sort of read about and to talk with you about what you were developing and, you know, the impact of it. Um, last, uh, last week we had uh, Matt uh, Gabriel Mariam Tesfau um, talking about what it meant to sort of work with youth and sort of think about bringing and developing newer generations in relation to this work. And I think that the, the um, coming together of all these different uh, layers, the connections between them and the potential synergies is really, really rich. 
Um, and I think that what it means to sort of um, uh, look to um, the, the younger generations to really think about um, what it means for them to be planning, you know, what the future is going to look like for them to be informing um, that future. And, uh, but I think that within, um, I was really um, uh, drawn to the uh, application itself because, you know, I, I think as, as um, just as much as like programming and um, projects uh, and platforms um, can function as platforms, that, I'm sorry, can fu function as templates. So can function as things that sort of provide uh, toolkits for other people to sort of engage in this kind of work. Um, I am always really curious about how like applications, right, can sort of provide an opportunity for the dreaming and thinking, can be an opportunity to sort of share certain reflections. And, um, I, you know, your uh, application is broken down um, first with, um, you know, needs assessment, um, which, right. which I really appreciate, right? So it, it speaks really specifically to why this work needs to happen in this place. And I think that really laying that out um, in an application process um, helps to really point um, to why the objectives are what they are, right? And so you give this sense of like, look, there's this real need, but these are the objectives that we have in doing this work. But the thing that I was really drawn to, um, it also talks about methods. The things that I was drawn to was actually the fact that in the end of the application, you have terms and definitions. And I really, uh, and I know that that's something that's present um, in your work and your mission, but um, I was really drawn to what it means to sort of um, uh, outline here um, the, the terms and definitions um, um, like it w w which really focus on indigenous, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that the way in which you break down um, indigenous within the context of this application is a really uh, powerful uh, way of, of, of really thinking about what that term actually stands for and the ways in which it's misused as well. Um, so I, I, if you're all right with that, I wanted to just read the, the, the way in which it's defined within the application. And then maybe you can talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the program itself, and maybe we can introduce uh, Jessica and have her talk a little bit about the work that she's been doing. Uh, but I'll go ahead and just read directly from uh, the application itself. Um, so it, it says, um, terms and definitions, indigenous, noun, indigenous communities are groups which have historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territories and consider themselves distinct from other sectors of societies now functioning on those territories or parts of them. They form at present sectors of society and are determined to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations their ancestral territories and their ethnic identity as the basis of their continued existence as people in accordance with their own cultural patterns, social institutions, and or legal systems. And I like the way that after that, you write other terms for indigenous include, and you've got African, African-American, Afro-Indigenous, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Diasporic, Native American, Aboriginal, and First Peoples. And I think we could, you know, the, the interesting things we could layer into that, right? We could keep adding um, other terms for it. Um, it's really magical the way that this, this term and the way which you unpack it really um, opens things up, opens the framework. Um, and so I wonder if you want to say a few words about um, the, the program itself um, and, and the ways in which, um, you know, the, the, the program operates within the context of, of Italy, um, but then also within the context of Germany, because you have these other, this other facet of it as well. And then, you know, the ways in which maybe there's an opportunity for an intersection also of these two um, environments in terms of the research that's being carried out. Right, right. And thank you for reading the definition. You, you won't believe how many times we get asked, so what is indigenous? How do you define it? And I'm like, bam, there it is. We, our, our organization definitely has like a, a more progressive or um, umbrella definition. Uh, if we wanna include uh, communities that identify as indigenous uh, in their traditional homelands. Um, and the majority of the time they are people of a darker hue. Um, again, we operate in parts of Africa uh, and a lot of, the, <laughs> a lot of the participants in Africa also have family or connections in Europe. Um, so that term indigenous, we really, or indigeneity as a whole is uh, really a historically global phenomenon. Um, and it's, we see it as ours to claim as well. Um, and in doing so, it 
kind of creates a, a, a kind of sphere for pan-indigeneity and solidarity. And that's really what our organization is all about. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that, that reading of the, of the definition. In the context of Italy, um, we know that, well, Black people, people of color have roamed through the lands and have uh, traded and lived and uh, conducted business, uh, studied in Italy since time immemorial. Um, and we understand that it's, it's history. Um, and people there living, living in Italy now who uh, may identify as African or Black or a person of color, um, they're entitled to basic human rights in the country where they reside or choose to live. And that's really um, where the Indigenous Advocacy and Research Program uh, can or is seeking to assist. Um, so this program really came about from uh, an invitation we received from the U.S. Consulate in Florence and the Human Rights, uh, the U.S. Department of State's Human Rights and uh, Advocacy Fund, um, where uh, just through conversations with the Consulate General, like personal conversations and meetings, um, we're just talking about like the realities that we see every day living in uh, in various parts of Italy. Um, but there is one common uh, you know, underlying uh, visible theme where they, they call them, I don't even like the term migrants, but immigrant communities or uh, African communities that come to Italy or even Italian citizens that are Black uh, face and inherit <laughs> discrimination. Um, and it's a different form of discrimination that is like not necessarily always in your face that's really uh, embedded in a legal practice. Um, and we wanted to shed light on that in a different way from a younger generation. Um, so basically, uh, like you were saying, the, in the, I guess, program methods, uh, we wanted to find a way where we can connect authentic community voices from Afro-Italian citizens or uh, recent uh, immigrants to the country um, that, that can, who can identify um, an area of research or a, a law that they feel is xenophobic or anti-Black, um, whether it be like have undertones of anti-Blackness or just blatantly exclude a certain minority group from participating in civil, uh, of the facet of civil society. And, you know, that we left the terms pretty broad for the researchers to, we really want our, our a lot of our programs uh, are designed to be youth-led. We want the participants to see themselves in the program, uh, to identify with the themes, and to take action um, in a communal and collaborative way. Um, so like you were saying, we have the program in Italy and also in Germany, and we kind of combine the cohorts together because we realized that no matter where you are in Europe, <laughs> uh, the struggle is real, you know? I think we may have uh, lost Ernest in the, in the process of uh, him, him talking. Um, uh, but if uh, I think, there he goes, I think he's coming back in. Hey, Ernest. Sorry, hey, I got disconnected. Yeah, um, yeah, I didn't know if it was me on my end or if it was uh, you. You know, I always uh, have that little glitch. But um, um, yeah, no, may, maybe if you want to. Um, just maybe introduce uh, Jessica and maybe we can, we hear a little bit about uh, firsthand some of what's been going on within the program itself. Yeah, yeah. So Jessica is one of our star fellows in the Indi Indigenous Advocacy and Research Program. She's based in Verona and her area of research is really focusing on 
uh, Italians' a response to COVID-19 uh, and their uh, lack of protocol for those who are part of the migrant community and also discriminatory policies against the LGBT community. Um, so uh, Jessica, without further ado, why don't you take the floor and tell us a bit about your research, if that's okay. Um, sure. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for today, actually. Um, I just wanted to really um, mention, since Justin, you mentioned Magda as well, um, um, just wanted to say that I was reading today um, a phrase that says, uh, I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but just having this conversation today really makes me feel like this. I'm like my uh, my child self while the stream right now. So thank you about that. Um, yeah, so I am conducting this research together with other volunteers. Um, some of them are today uh, in the public here. Um, we are focusing, so um, yeah, in the beginning, um, my research focus was on uh, the response of the Italian government to the COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, with regards to um, access to healthcare um, of immigrant people um, in general. Um, but that was more in the beginning of the application process. Um, while I was meeting like these associations, I think my research uh, kind of shifted towards a more artistic and uh, as Ernest said, LGBTQI plus um, approach. Um, so I'm basically interviewing um, and meeting these associations, um, which are based locally here in Verona. Um, in, particular, in particular, one is called uh, Pink Refugees, and they, they provide uh, service and mental health support to um, these uh, people that basically intersect between the refugee reality and being LGBT. And we are creating a campaign that is going to be um, spread, disseminated, um, mostly online, but also we are uh, trying to uh, get other associations involved that do not have that don't have anything to do with refugees, but they do um, try to integrate and uplift people that are marginalized from the uh, labor market. So um, we're getting in contact with DHA, which is um, they call it Sartoria Sociale, which is a social tailor shop, maybe <laughs> tailor tailory. I don't know. Um, so we're thinking about creating tote bags that one of the artists that um, is a member of the Ref uh, Pink Refugees um, is basically illustrate, like he's gonna create an illustration. I, I just received it like uh, right before this conference actually, it looks very good. Um, so we're gonna use that to promote um, all the uh, merch. That's our idea for now. That's the most visible one. Um, I, I had this sort of idea of an, of an event where people can actually customize their tote bags. And in that way, we could uh, get more people involved, especially like younger generations, but that might require a little bit more, more time and, and um, organization. So it's still up in the air, but this is the plan for now. I wanted to mention that Jessica and all the fellows are also uh, drafting working papers that will be tied or connected to their advocacy work. And yeah. these working papers will be uh, uh, presented in the form of a digital publication that will be disseminated by Soul of Nations, but then also uh, the US Department of State's, uh, I guess, diplomatic channels uh, to further the applied pressure to the Italian government at the local, regional, and national level as well. So um, their research is going to be a, a written representation of the times. It could be something they can always refer to um, and track to see like uh, in 2022, this is what we're going through and maybe see in 10 years, uh, this was a, a, a small push forward um, or a way to apply, or to keep uh, elected officials accountable in the various regions as well. So super proud of her work. Thank you. I'm proud of being part of Soul of Nations 100%, so thank you. Cool, cool. 
Yeah, no, it's really great to hear um, about the research and also to think about the ways in which um, um, I think it's always in intriguing to think about all the different forms that advocacy can take um, so that the ways in which like a, a campaign that's about raising a certain awareness um, can go down these sort of creative avenues um, and then also have these these um, uh, various uh, approaches to actually arriving at the public. So from having a tote bag that's been designed, illustrated in this way, and then I think that what you're what you're talking about in terms of bringing people together to personalize, um, the language of workshop is always a language to sort of um, invite people into a deeper exchange, right? Um, to sort of share space in a certain sense. Um, and I think that um, those kinds of um, approaches are, are more and more needed, right? To sort of, um, once the sort of awareness has sort of gone out, what are those opportunities to invite people um, back in, right? To sort of continue the work that was started. Um, and I think that that's really, um, really wonderful. And I think that also the digital publications and sort of sharing that is something that's really, uh, really powerful in terms of, again, like, you know, so, so much of um, the, the advocacy and the work that is happening right now in the context of Italy is um, really unprecedented um, in a lot of ways. Um, sadly, it's really unprecedented. And um, the, the role that the archive that these initiatives um, create, um, it, you know, it is really, uh, it's incredible in terms of really thinking about, okay, the way in which this moment or these years are marked by um, these archives, by this work, by the presence of, um, you, you know, uh, younger advocates who are, who are really doing this work and sort of leaving behind traces that can be can be followed, right? Can be looked to, can be um, forms of inspiration for new forms of research. Um, right. So it's really, really exciting to hear that. Um, and I particularly, um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, like the uh, Sartoria Sociale, you know, the, the uh, I guess, social tailors. I think there's something really interesting about the layers of that because I think that there's, there's a lot of magic whenever, um, you, you can involve certain, certain um, crafts, um, certain handwork um, and sort of messaging, right? Because in a certain sense, these are bags, but these bags become the containers of whatever they're going to carry, right? So there's some, some interesting metaphors within that, but I think the idea of Sartoria Sociale um, is something that may be less familiar to the audience. And so I, I don't know if you wanna say just a couple words about why that context, right? And what it is. Sure. Um, actually, the funny thing is I have to um, have a call schedule with them tomorrow um, because I, I had heard of them before. They, they're they based literally like a street across my house, um, but I never got in touch with them. And when I when I was at Pink Refugees, uh, the artist actually, he told me, oh, you could get them involved. Uh, so that was like a very <laughs> sweet um, coincidence, I would say. Um, but basically what they do is um, they train um, marginalized women or women with um, disadvantaged um, backgrounds that kind of struggle to get into the labor market um, through teaching them how to sew, how to um, design clothing, basically. Um, and after that, of course, they sell these project, the projects and that's where they're based. Like I know their physical shop, which is here close by. Um, and yeah, this is what I can tell for now from the, um, from the website. They, they do have uh, social media as, my, as well as uh, Pink Refugees and all the associations that we're involved in or we're involving, like we're trying to get involved. Yeah, it's I can share it like in the chat as well. well yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, Ernest, I mean, I think, um, you know, within the, the range of, of uh, projects and platforms that have been developed in the context of Solar Nations, um, I, I know that one of them, um, I don't want to mess the name up. I think it's called Green Architecture. Uh, yeah, the Green Architecture I, I, Project. I was always really um, inspired by um, you know, some of the intercultural exchange that that, that work embodies um, and what it means to sort of think about um, the, the transmission of knowledge production um, and, you know, what it means to conserve those things, yet what it means also to grow through the sort of exchange and interface with other, um, you know, uh, realities that are anchored in different histories. I think 
there's some magic within that that I'm I'm really really curious about. I wonder if you could say just a little bit about what what that represents. It's a it seems like it's a big world um, because I know it's it's something you've been developing over the years. But um, you know if you could say a few things about that because I think it again um, is another um, uh, opportunity to think about um, the ways in which the platform of Soul of Nations is bringing people together in all these different ways. Right. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up too. Uh, the, so the Green Architecture Project, it is a fellowship that's uh, facilitated both hybrid and, and uh, or sorry, in-person and online um, that connects indigenous uh, architects, artists, researchers around the world um, that uh, focusing on the following themes, uh, environmental stability and indigenous futurism. Um, so basically, the program connects uh, vernacular forms of architecture, uh, asking the artist questions like what is home, both from a practical standpoint, like focusing on uh, traditional indigenous uh, or African forms of domestic architecture, but then also from a more philosophical standpoint, like what does home mean to you? What was your upbringing and cultural practices? Uh, uh, what does home smell like to you? It could be food, it could be a song or a story your grandmother told you when you were younger. Um, and just hashing out the dialogue and finding linkages or differences between communities. So tradi uh, traditionally or usually, we uh, have the cross-cultural exchange from uh, members from the US uh, with members from other countries. So right now we operated um, and we started in Rwanda, East Africa. Uh, Nigeria, now we're doing Kenya and Bolivia. Um, and it's just been really fascinating uh, to see uh, and also really validating for organizational like mission and values as we try to bridge uh, the gap between, you know, people of color who identify as indigenous people uh, and seeing that we're more similar than different. And no matter what part of the world we're, we come from, um, our vernacular forms of being are beautiful, <laughs> you know, uh, for, for a long time or for, for many years, like we're taught to think that uh, traditional forms of housing that were built on the continent of Africa were subpar and uh, not, you know, <laughs> uh, not built uh, to last, um, but that's a, a false narrative. Um, these structures uh, were held ceremonies. Uh, they have they coincide with a lot of stories that have been passed down for generations, and we just want to shed light on that, uh, but while also touching on uh, topics related to environmentalism, um, like affordable housing. What does that look like? Uh, you know, the majority of the fellows, I think about 90% are women um, or non-binary. And it's, uh, we wanna ask them like, what does home mean to you as far as like uh, the symbolism between home and body and, and place? Uh, so yeah, it's been super fascinating to kind of merge these lines of, again, like we're, we're driven by artist activism. So all of our programs are gonna have an underlying message um, and so far, it's been really fascinating to see like how how our fellows interpret home, um, both from like a host historical and contemporary sense, um, merging the stories that they've been told from their grandparents and pushing it, pushing it into the future. Um, so yeah, I don't yeah. Know, I hope that was like not too long winded, but no, no, that's 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 beautiful, and I think it it creates some uh, some nice connections. I mean, one of the things that came to mind as you were you were talking about. Um, the ways in which um, um, architect architecture uh, is considered, um, as you said, subpar, and you know this idea of not being built to last. I think that one of the things that I grapple with and think about all the time is the sort of the arrogance of permanence um, and what it means to try to you know create something that needs to be there forever. And I think that a lot of times architectural objectives exist within that space, um, which is a space um, that is is not necessarily in touch with the land, um, with the earth, with sustainability, with what it means for, for things to change and maybe have their own time. 
Um, so I think it's really intriguing to, to, to look at um, that work and to think about what it means to share these practices, right? Um, and to, to have, think about the impact of these architectural practices on the earth. Um, from a comparative standpoint, I think that's really powerful. Um, but I think the other thing that you uh, touched on that I think really connects uh, the dots between all of these things is this notion of what home is. Uh, and I think that, you know, um, within the context of the, the broader spectrum of work that's being done, um, it's, it's an important question, I think, also within this context of Italy to be thinking about um, amongst the, the, ad, the you know, the advocates that you have together, activists that you're encountering, you know, what is, what is home, both in terms of, um, you know, uh, the ways in which, um, you know, um, Italy, uh, you know, may be understood through that lens, right, um, and the ways in which home, um, in, in a lot of ways, you know, we can think about it through a certain language of, of warmth uh, and welcome. Um, but we can also think about all those other layers of home because every home has these other realities that it grapples with as well, right? Um, like not everything within the home is about being comfortable and being welcome. And I think that those um, disaccords um, actually paint a, a bigger picture of what home uh, typically looks like and um, some of the choices we make and how we narrate that. Um, so I think it's really uh, sort of fitting overarching question in relation to um, all of this work, right? Um, and I think that indigeneity is looking at, you know, home, like what does it mean to call a place home, to say that you are indigenous to a place, you know, how is that defined? Um, so I think that there's a really powerful connecting thread um, through all of that. So I, I don't know if there are any um, uh, questions. I think we have some questions that came up maybe in the Q&A uh, that we can take a look at, um, you know, and. Um, and uh, you know, try to open up to the floor. If anyone has any questions um, for for Ernest or for for Jessica, we can um, you can put them into the question and answer, and we can uh, try to um, address them. I know that um, there's uh, let's see now there's we can start at the at the top, I think. Um, and there's uh, there's one question that um, is from Fabrizia Baldissera. And it says, would the foundation also be interested in programs that enhance black creativity from Africa? Um, and this is speaking um, specifically to um, work that's been done um, through a project called Jail. Um, I'm trying to read it properly. Uh, that is uh, connected to uh, a prison in, in Cameroon. Um, and I am not going to do just to the full question because it gets kind of more specific, but I think, you know, maybe the broader question of the interest in programs that are enhanced black creativity from Africa. And I think this right. is looking at specific um, social um, activism that's happening um, within that space. So. Right, right, right. Um, well, yeah, that was really like why we wanted to create the Green Architecture Project. We've been doing a lot of cross-cultural exchanges between the US and Europe with migrant communities or uh, minority communities in, in Europe for a while. Um, but then we asked ourselves the question, like, why don't we just go to the source <laughs> uh, and you know, learn from the creatives um, in, in their home countries? Uh, so we started in Rwanda, now we're in uh, Nigeria and Kenya. So slowly but surely, we're trying our best to uh, create space for an authentic uh, African and indigenous narrative that can be merged or that has synergy, you know? Um, and I'll, like, this, these are really like, the artists don't really know each other before they start the program. So they are tasked with the, they're, they're asked with asked to collaborate for uh, throughout the, the program term. The, the, the term lasts about a year. Um, so yeah, we're 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 definitely trying to you know work with Africans living in Africa, right. uh, and we we we've loved doing so so far. Yeah, this is uh, the I, the project I was trying to reference is called Jail Time Music, and it's uh, about. Um, recording rooms within a jail in Cameroon specifically, uh, but the link is uh, within the Q and A, so you can take a look. Uh, but I know that as uh, as you do work, I mean, as as we do work, there's always this sort of looking out to think about 
what's happening, um, who, who is making things and then what possible. A lot of times just sort of coming across projects like this one that's mentioned here. Uh, thank you, Fabrizia. This, um, you know, it's sometimes it just sort of stimulates a certain um, thought um, that might not have been there about forms of collaboration that are possible. Um, right. And so there's an, another question that is about, um, you know, if students at NYU Florence wanted to be involved in the kinds of work or connected to the work, um, what, what are possible um, avenues for that? You know? Maybe yeah, directly in relation to some of the advocacy project that, that just happened. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, right now we're work, working with a few universities to develop like an internship program in, in Florence, uh, but with NYU specifically, um, really just sharing the work, talking about it with your friends. Uh, if, if you know any people who are directly connected to these communities, uh, asking them what they need. I mean, it's not necessarily about how to help our organization. It's really just how to help the people that we're trying to provide a platform for. Um, yeah, just find ways to, uh, things that resonate with you. Um, and I mean, you can always e email us uh, for direct ways to support. Um, email, the best email is just info at soulofnations.org. You can DM us on Instagram, Soul of Nations. Uh, yeah, so we're always, always looking to involve students, especially uh, who are knowledgeable or want to be become more knowledgeable about the work that we do, for sure. Yeah, and thank you, Tony. Uh, that's from Tony Blackwell uh, writing that question. Um, but I think that, you know, um, the the interesting thing also is about like what you, you, you talked about the sort of digital magazine as one um, format for sharing the research that's coming out. Um, but are there also sort of more public forums uh, for sharing that? I mean, like here we have Jessica with us tonight. Are there other moments that you envision where um, the, um, um, the the advocates will come together and maybe share in more of a public forum some of the work that's been done? Um, you know, is that something definitely. that will happen as you yes. said? Yes, definitely. So after the end of the program, which ends uh, in March, the fellows will have I call a, a virtual reception or hybrid reception, but she'll try to figure out what the guidelines are at the embassy. It'll most likely either be at the embassy uh, in, in Rome or the consulate in Florence. Um, and yes, yeah, so the, all the fellows will join together to discuss their working papers and advocacy deliverables. And uh, we're hoping to receive input from the community as well during that time. So uh, we'd love everyone to, to join us and join them. That's really fantastic. And I mean, I know that in, um, you know, going through thinking about and sharing um, the, the work, um, you know, for, from from our standpoint, the recovery plan is always um, there as a site for gathering and sort of coming together and having these conversations, either publicly or even also privately, right, just amongst yeah. the advocates themselves. Um, and I think that um, definitely sort of thinking about ways in which we uh, could could share um, the research itself, right, and try to push it, because I think a lot of the collection of this research and reflection is about how to then we get that into as many hands as possible in right. order to really put, uh, develop pressure and to really, you know, push um, for change um, with, within this context. And I right. think that um, hopefully by connecting, I mean, I'm really excited about the, the connections also between um, the, the uh, researchers in the context of Italy and then also the researchers that are in the context of Germany coming together um, because there's lots of synergies I've seen over um, the years um, in these two different contexts that have really uh, different histories um, and, and different relationships to all of these things. But, but ultimately, like you said, there's, there's a way in which, you know, finding those synergies and also speaking to each other based on these these different experiences is a great way to sort of talk about in my context this is what's happening right now these are the things we're thinking about this is how we're confronting them and by sharing in that way somehow you can sort of help each other to sort of see beyond some of those blinders some of those obstacles um, but I think that overall um, you know the the work that you're you're doing is really um, uh, powerful incredible we're really uh, happy to connect with you. And um, I wanna thank you and Jessica for taking the time to join us tonight um, to share this work um, and to really um, give, give a sense of like, you know, what it means to really be actively engaged in this environment. And I really appreciate the fact that you're actively engaged in so many different environments and that so much of it is about the fluidity of these borders, so. Um, thank you, Justin, this has been, this has been a pleasure. And uh, thank you for allowing like 
allowing our organization to, you know, be introduced to a whole new group of folks who are interested in these themes uh, might not just be for Black History Month, for the actual month, but we hope that this this um, interest will continue uh, for you know years to come. Uh, you're a visionary for our organization as well. Just seeing your work in Italy and like uh, um, the obstacles that you faced along the way, and just have persisted and have stayed true to your core mission. It's super, super, super uh, just inspiring for us, you know. Uh, so thank you for just being that light in your community and or just around the world too. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> well, the gratitude goes both ways. I mean, I, we're we're also looking directly at the work that you're doing and thinking about ways in which we can be inspired by it. So um, you know, um, really happy to sort of be in, in con continued dialogue and to grow in this way. Um, and looking forward to seeing more um, of uh, Jessica's research and of the other researchers to really see what emerges. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times, um, you know, this kind of work is sort of like planting a seed, establishing, establishing the network in the beginning, really mapping out some of the things that need to be addressed. And then from there, it's really about, okay, how do we step back into that work and, and you know, Get, get down to business. So I, I really appreciate um, this as a sort of also early point in something that I hope will be a really long standing relationship um, with all of you. Um, and so I thank um, all of you for being here. Thank you, Jessica, for, for joining us. And um, I want to thank uh, Lucia and, and in general, NYU, the staff. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to also just mention that next uh, week we will be with um, um, Daphne Di Shinto uh, to talk about. Um, film as advocacy, art as advocacy. Um, yeah, Jessica, I don't know if you had a, another thing you wanted to add. It's a kind of gesture, right? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add that um, with this program, with the fellowship, we, we're not just helping the African community in Italy or the immigrant community, uh, but it's also a great opportunity for us Afro-European of like a younger generation probably than yours to have the possibility to kind of get exposure through a publication. So the work that Ernest, you and Soul of Nations are doing is not just for just <laughs> for the African community, but for for us, second generation and yeah. in between, if you will, as well. So thank you about that again. <laughs> just wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and I mean, I'm really, um, uh, it's, it's really, um, exciting to see this kind of work taking place and and like i said i'm really looking forward to seeing what's produced um and so we'll connect um very soon um wish you all a, a great evening and um you know there's plenty 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 of events uh, still left in this month of february um, um so please take the time to look at the the broad program um a lot of the events are online i'm also coming from torino coming from rome and so definitely take a look and it's a way to sort of take some of the conversations that we had tonight and extend them into all these other spheres and find those connectivities. So, um, and then feel free to drop through the recovery plan. I mean, the, the space is open uh, nine to seven, Monday through Friday. So um, drop in, uh, take some time, sit down, look at things, read some books um, and, you know, leave some feedback. And um, uh, thank you all. Have a really great night. Awesome. Thank you.